Good morning, everyone, Good morning. and welcome to Shoreline Community Church. We are so glad that you are joining us online today. I am Krista, and I'm an admin in the church office. And I am Michael, and I am the worship pastor here at SCC. We would love for you to fill out your connection card today. Whether you're new or you have a prayer request or you want more information, let us know on your connection card. You can find the link in the comments or on the Church Center app. Here's what our service looks like this morning. First, we're going to open up with scripture and prayer, and we're going to pray for some of our missionaries. Next, we'll be worshiping through songs as we're singing together and praising God this morning. Then we'll have a message from Pastor Kim in our Promises series. After that, at the end of the service, we'll all be taking communion together. So grab something to eat, something to drink, and hang on to that until the end of the service so that we can celebrate the Lord's Supper together. Before we get started, here are a few announcements. On August 21st, we have a great opportunity to partner with Shoreline Schools with their Back to School event, providing supplies and services for kids in our area. So you can find signups on our website or on the Church Center app. On the last Sunday of this month, August 29th, we're going to have another outdoor gathering in the back behind the church, uh, along with TLC. Pastor Harry is going to be preaching, and it's going to be just an awesome time. So bring your own chair, bring some water, and just come out for a great uh, Sunday. That's at 10.30 a.m. Groups are also coming up soon, so here's Pastor Dwayne and Pastor Kim to tell you more. Hey, Sherlock Community Church family. Thank you for joining us today. And today I'm excited because we have our group's pastor, Pastor Kim. Hey, Pastor Kim. Hey. How's morning. your summer going? It's going really well. <laughs> I know that you've been going a lot back and forth to Cali from California to here, but it's good to have her back again. And this fall, we have an exciting opportunity that we're going to be jumping on that Pastor Kim's going to be leading because over COVID season, we've had so many leaders just jump up and engage and find new ways. And so now as we relaunch with this new opportunity of the fall, we want to do what it says in Ephesians 4. We want to equip the saints, it's all of you, for the work of ministry and to do that. So, Pastor Kim, how are we going to do that? Just, eat, just uh, come alongside and equip and prepare people for what God's calling them to do. Well, the discipleships team decided to create a curriculum out of the book Amplified Leadership. And so, uh, Katie Meredith and Eric Dridal and Rob Walworth will, and myself mm -hmm. will be teaching a leadership course in 204, 204. We'll at, give 9 you a map. <laughs> in, at 9 a.m. on yep. Sundays. And this is a, a great uh, leadership course no matter where you're leading in life mm -hmm. uh, because we, we lead in the home, we lead at work, mm -hmm. and we lead in ministry. But, you know, we talk about uh, being a disciple that makes disciples, right? Right. But, and we see ourselves as disciples, but it feels like a magic formula to make disciples. Well, this gives you the basics for the leadership part mm -hmm. of that, to really uh, learn to connect and to help people move in their relationship with Christ just through the basic principles of leadership. So good. Yeah. Well, there are five areas, right? So yeah. you, you want to kind of talk about the five areas that we're going to be diving into? Well, the five areas are establish a relationship, um, engage a follower, embrace a team member, coach an apprentice, and mentor a new leader. And when we did this as the discipleship team, I saw people just take off and overnight just wow, be so able to implement. So you guys actually did this. It. Yes. Very cool. Very yeah, cool. we went we went through it last year, and then okay. the, I saw the team members just implement it, and it really um, was easy for them to grasp and to mm. implement. Well, and I love it too. I remember when uh, your son Andrew gave me the book, and I read it. I actually, read it over vacation. I'm on my second read through now, and it's just a very very powerful. And I heard I think Dan Ryland's the author. Mm -hmm. I heard I heard an interview him talking about it. And he talked about how it's, it's theological, but it's very practical. And a lot of times we hear these big things like discipleship, but this makes it really practical for us, right. which I'm very excited about. Yeah, there's a lot of leadership that's taught out there, and I've taken a lot of classes. Mm -hmm. I think this is the part of leadership that nobody teaches. Right. They just assume everybody knows it. It's the how do you do it. Yeah, and yeah. for people, I don't know, I think 80% of us just hope that we'll someday catch what everybody else is <laughs> right. thinking we'll catch. Right. So this just puts it down into words, makes it very practical and easy to apply. So who is this class for? Like, who can come to this class? Um, Anybody can come to this class. Probably you want to be 12 and above. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you uh, want to be a leader or are leading in any way, this will help you in all of those relationships. Mm -hmm. And like I said in the beginning, we lead at home, mm -hmm. we lead at work, we lead at school, and we lead at church. Well, it's as you go. I mean, Jesus, the mm -hmm. discipleship maker, I mean, he was in the marketplace, he was in the home, he was pulling people out of trees. I mean, it was just everything. I think that's a great model for us. And our goal is to not make it complicated. You know, that's when we ruin it, right? But we want to simplify it 
centered on God's word, centered around the model of Christ. So make sure that you're engaging with that. I know we're also gonna have a Facebook group that'll kind of follow up and go with it. So lots of great tools. We'll put some links in there for the book if you wanna go ahead and get the book. I did it on Kindle because I like having everything electronic with me, but you can also get a paperback, but make sure that you get that. And if you have any other questions, we'll put Pastor Kim's email. They can reach out to you and talk about it, right? Absolutely, yeah. We are asking that all leaders right now go through this mm -hmm. so that we're all have on the same page and have the same language and the same starting place. So. Well, unity, so important. Yeah. As we walk forward in this new season, we need to be unified. So we're gonna be inviting our board members, our group leaders, our staff and our team and, and everyone in part of us. So be, be praying about that. But boy, receive this as I'm inviting all of you. God's called you all to lead as we go. So be sure to be a part of it. And just want to say thank you, Pastor Kim, just for the incredible job of being a part of our team and, and just really leading this so well. So thank you so much. Well, thank you for the opportunity. All right. Sign up. <laughs> it's going to be an awesome group. If you're a leader in the church, we really encourage you to take that, get the book. Um, it's going to be an awesome time. So we also have another group season coming up starting in September. So I just encourage you to go to the website, check out the Church Center app where you can find more information about groups. Today we're going to be learning more about and praying for Paul and Larissa Dobson who are missionaries in Southeast Asia. Their mission there is to encourage and equip third culture kids and families to love the amazing people of Southeast Asia. Paul works as a school counselor for international high school students and Larissa does a lot of work with survivors of human trafficking. Let's pray for the Dobson family. God, I pray for the Dobsons as they are serving in Southeast Asia, that you would just bless their ministry, that you would guide them, that you would protect them. We pray for all the people that they are serving, God, for uh, refugees, for uh, survivors of abuse, God, I, and for high school students, Lord, that you would just, um, in each of these groups, that you would use the Dobsons, that you would move in mighty ways. And I just pray that as a church, we would be holding them up in prayer, um, not just once, but just every, every day, every week, as they um, come up into our memories, that we, you would prompt us to pray for them, Lord. We just thank you for all that you're doing there. Thank you um, that you are bringing our church SEC into community, um, allowing us to uh, help with the mission of spreading the gospel, God. We just thank you for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. So today, as we get started, we're going to open by reading Psalm 113, 1 through 3 together. So you can join me. Let's praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, you his servants. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised, both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. So let's pray together as we get started. Jesus, thank you for the opportunity and the privilege that it is to be able to gather together online. We pray that our hearts would be open to hear from you and that the praise that we sing and the praise that uh, we live out in our lives would be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Isn't that wonderful that God makes all things new? He really does. And we've been talking about the Promises series. And this, is, this, this worship song just really applies it to our lives in a, in a deep way. So let's go ahead and pray. God, we just thank you that you do make all things new and that we can trust you in the parts of our life that feel like they're falling apart. We can trust you in the parts of our life that are new and we can trust you with our future when we don't know what's happening because you are the one who makes us into the people you created us to be. Lord, we pray for your work in our lives in that. And we pray that we become the people you created us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I hope that you've had a, a good morning so far. And I know later we're going to do communion, so you might want to take a moment to go get that. But first, I wanted to talk to you about... Um, and thank you for your giving. Uh, this is a season where everything seems to be a little odd, but uh, many of you have put the uh, set it up on the app so it's auto-deducted from your bank account. You don't have to worry about remembering. I know that that's what we've done. And just being able to uh, put your money before God and let him do the work, it's not only good for you, but then we're able to do ministry to in our neighborhood and with the people that God's called us to. So thank you very much for your giving. And I'm going to pray again real quick, but I'm going to pray over our finances. God, I just thank you that everything we have is yours and that you give us the opportunity to bring 10% to you. And Lord, then you multiply it to reach people and make a difference in their lives. Lord, I pray that you would bless each person as they give today. Lord, that you would help them if they, if they go online or if they mail in their check. Lord, they would just see your immediate provision. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, before I get into uh, the scripture today, I wanted to uh, just circle back. You saw Pastor Dwayne and I earlier talking about the leadership class, and that's going to start on September 12th. It will run for 10 weeks, and it's 9 o'clock on Sunday mornings. You'll want to buy the book Amplified Leadership by Dan Ryland. Uh, but if you could go online to shorelinecc.com slash groups or do it through the church app, then you will be able to see, uh, you'll be able to sign up. And then if you have any questions, just reach out because I'm glad to help you. Um, also, I wanted to pinpoint that the group leaders meeting is next Sunday right after church in the fireside room. So I hope to see you there. And so, so far in our promises series, we've looked at these promises. I will forgive you. I am your strength. I will never leave you. I have a plan for your life. I will hear you. I will give you peace. I will restore. I will provide. You hear the basic in there? I start. I will. This is God saying he will do these things. And so this week we're going to look at God's promise in Isaiah 41, 10 13 and 14. He says, I will help you. He says it three times in five verses. He says he will help us. So let's take a little look at that and find out what it's all about. See, in order to really understand the scripture, you want to understand the context behind it. And so um, let's, um, let's delve into that. First, in order to understand the context, we need to understand idols. Um, and the reason is because um, this is where Israel was really at. So, you know, there are things that we often turn to. Every one of us has these things that we turn to when we're too hungry or too angry or too lonely or too tired. They, they might be habits or superstitions or ways of doing things that reduce our anxiety and help us maintain our equilibrium in times of stress. They aren't healthy they aren't healthy like going for a run, or, or, but they're our only way of coping. And the, the problem with that is that we might even find, um, instead of leaning on God and having healthy habits, we lean on these other things, and they're idols. And sometimes, a lot of times in our society, our idol is our own self-reliance. And so... Um, Israel had these two. They refused to rely only on God. Instead, they maintained other places of worship. Aside from the temple, which is 
from where they, God wanted them to worship. They had, they would mix um, worship of God and folk religions from the area in high places. And if you read the Bible, you'll see king after king. He was a good king, but he didn't demolish the high places. He added more to the high places. I mean, there's only one king that did all of the above, that got rid of the high places and made all the worship of God central. Um, after many generations of this, uh, of Israel not leaning on God, God allowed the Israelites to be taken into captivity by Babylon. You see, with God, you might see that as destruction, right? But really, it's grace. Because with God, we have a choice. We have freedom. We can choose not to be under his protection. And he'll oblige. Yet God didn't stop being with Israel and helping them, even when they were bearing the difficult circumstances of their choice to remove themselves from God's protection. God doesn't leave us in hard times. The first uh, part of Isaiah is full of warnings of you know, you need to lean on me. You need to trust me. And then when we get to Isaiah 40, the tone of the entire book changes. And God is no longer warning people of hard times. Instead, he's consoling them. And he's, um, and as they go through the hard times, he's drawing them back into relationship. He knows that they're about to get the opportunity to once again be independent, not in a foreign land, and lean completely on him. And so, because Cyrus, the Persian, is about to march on Babylon and overthrow their oppressors. In fact, we know from history that he allowed the Jewish people to return to Judea. Right now, the Israelites have been in captivity for a long time, and God is reaching out to them, trying to reestablish his relationship with them. Even after a couple of generations in captivity, Israel had become good at relying on idols. Freedom creates space, and the Israelites will soon have a new opportunity to build their lives on God's provision, or to continue to rely on themselves and false gods. Up to this point, when they followed the dictates of their covenant with God, it was to appease him, as if he were one of the many gods used to make, um, that they made themselves. That they, and also that he was one of many gods that they said, this is what's going to make me okay. And so that means they weren't really relying on him. We do the same thing, don't we? Instead of re really relying on God for our strength, often we use him as one of our resources. The difference is huge. If God is one of our resources, then we're relying on ourselves to use our resources well. If God is our only source, then we're relying only on him. And that's what he's asking for us. He's asking for a trust relationship. You see, God in the overarching story of time is on a mission to help every human come to the point of relationship where we not only trust God, but we trust in him. You know, this morning you might be sitting up in your bed, or you might be sitting on a couch or on the floor. But if you, um, if you think about it for a minute, when you walked into the room, whatever you're sitting on now looks like a good, op a good place to sit. And it could continue to be a good place to sit. And you might even perch on the edge of it, but kind of keep most of your weight on your legs because you're not really going to trust if this thing's going to really work. And a lot of us, that's how we trust in God, is we have one foot still keeping most of our balance. But when you sat down and put all your weight on it, you trusted in what you were sitting on. And that's the moment when we know that we are really trusting in God, is when there, there's nothing else. We've put all of our weight on it, and he either comes through or not. One of my favorite phrases is, God is God or he's not. And you, you really have to choose which ones you're going to pick. Because God is God. But in my heart, am I going to allow him? Am I going to trust in him that he is God, my only God? And so, what does trusting 
in God look like kind of in a practical sense? We talked about the, you know, the high level, but let's look at it. When people stress us out, do we manipulate and connive to get our way? Maybe giving God a list of how to change them? Or do we take the problem to God and wait for his answer? When our resources don't seem to stretch, do we spend our time worrying, finagling the budget, and trying to figure out where our resources will come from? Or do we take the whole thing to God and wait for his provision? This week, I talked to one of my kids about tithing. And, you know, my, overall, I think they've been pretty good about tithing, but it's one thing to trust God when you're working for extra money. And it's another to put in your full tithe when your income is supporting your room, your board, your tuition, your car payment. And so this type of trust can feel a little bit like jumping off the high dive, hoping there's enough water in the pool. <laughs> um, this trust muscle, for many I've noticed, is developed over time. They, they trust a little more and a little more and a little more, and they eventually get up to a full tithe. Uh, for Wes and I, it was not that way. Um, trusting God with our finances was really jumping off the high dive. You see, money can become an idol, and sometimes it's... Uh, more often, I think, an indicator if we trust God completely or if we really have made an idol of our own self-reliance and aren't leaning completely on God. Wes and I, uh, when we were younger, much younger, um, we, in the early, areas, or early years of our marriage, we always tied on some of our income, but maybe not the whole part. It kind of went back and forth. But there came a time when... Um, we really hit the wall. Wes had started working for the Carpenters Union, and our second child was born. And we were apartment managers of a small complex. And so that paid our rent. But then, um, as you know, those jobs, uh, by the job trades, Wes got laid off, which is perfectly normal. But we hadn't been in that situation for very long, and so our unemployment was incredibly low. It was $108 a week. And much like the Israelites, we were afraid. We were afraid that we wouldn't have what we needed. We, weren't, we were afraid that God wouldn't come through. And just like God came alongside the Israelites, he came alongside us. Um, this was during this time is when God reminded us to tithe. And so we started giving God $10.80 a week. Now, I got to tell you, it's a lot harder to give $10.80 a week out of 108 than it is to give 100 out of 1,000. And God showed up. Within a couple months, God not only provided a new, better-paying job, but then he started further challenging us to start tithing on our rent. Our rent was non-cash coming in, so it was more cash going out. And that was the next jump for us. And as soon as we did it, as soon as we did it, I, uh, we received a bonus because if in our apartment complex, if everything was paid, if everybody paid on time and all of the apartments were full, we were given a bonus. Well, the bonus we were given, at 11 out of the next 12 months, um, was more than double the amount that God had challenged us to tithe. God, I have story after story of how God challenged us and we stepped out in faith. But we don't start there, do we? That we learn to trust God by trusting him. So in today's scripture, Israel is in that in-between time. They believe in God, but they aren't sure about relying on him. They aren't sure he'll be trusted, he can be trusted, and so they have formed other coping mes mes mechanisms. God calls these idols. At the beginning of chapter 41, God sets up a proof for the Jews, just kind of like geometry. Here's who I am, and now tell me who your idols are and what they'll do. And he lists everything that he does. And then later in the chapter, the idols are silent. And he says, who's real? And so as we go through this, um, a lot of what we're reading today in the scripture is who, God saying who he is. So here's a question for you to consider before we go into the scripture. Do I trust God, really? I'll let you think on that for just a moment. As we read this chapter, we get to know what trusting God can look like. Let's read what God is saying to the Israelites in Isaiah 41, starting in verse 8. 
But you, Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, you whom I took to the ends of the earth and called from its farthest corners, saying to you, you are my servant, I have chosen you and not cast you off. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Before all who are incensed, behold, all who are incensed against you will be put to shame and confounded. Those who strive against you shall be as nothing and shall perish. You shall seek those who contend with you, but you shall not find them. Those who war against you shall be as nothing at all. For I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. It is I who says to you, fear not, I am with you. I am the one who helps you. Fear not, you worm of Jacob, you men of Israel. I am the one who helps you, declares the Lord. Your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. So God says we can trust him because he'll help us. Let's look at what God's help looks like just a little bit. He says two things that are interesting. He says he upholds us with his right hand of his righteousness, and he helps us by being our source of strength. When it says, um, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand, the right hand is the place of strength. And the Hebrew actually says for that verse, um, and I believe that was verse 10, I will uphold you with my right hand or strength of my righteousness. God's righteousness is the source of his strength. We all want to be on the side of what's right, but the action here isn't on our part. Just like in Ephesians 6, our job is to stand. God, whose strength comes from his righteousness, will hold us up. And then it says that when others come against us, they'll fall. Righteousness is God's alone, and, we can, and we're dependent on him to follow, to build that rightness within us. And when others come against us, we don't fight them. We rely on God. Then... God becomes the source of our strength. God promises that he will hold our right hand. Remember, the right hand is the source of strength. To stand on the right hand of someone, of anyone in that time, is the same as giving them aid or giving them your strength. By holding our right hand, God is the source of our strength. We often have this backwards. We tend to think that if we're on the side of right enough, then we'll win. If we can be right enough, then we'll get God's resources. But this makes it very clear that God is the one who puts the, right, the ability to be right in us. He's the one who builds it in us. He's the one who gives us the strength. It all comes from him. When we're trying to rely on ourselves first, that's when we get off. That's when the, the gods become prolific in our life rather than leaning on God as our soul strength. When we walk through the valleys of life, we can rest in the fact that God won't abandon us, but he will help us. When we have need, he will be there. In our hyper-independent society, though, we have a few questions about relying so heavily on God. We'll look at some New Testament examples to find these answers. First of all, is God disappointed in our lack of faith? There are times in life when we feel like we've been following God, but suddenly the waves threatened to sweep over us. Everything seems to be going wrong. In our hyper-independent society, we think we should be able to handle it ourselves. And in Mark 4, 35 to 41, we read of a time when the disciples um, needed to lean on Jesus. But I think today we might misread this scripture. So let's read it together. Mark 4, 35 to 41. That day, when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind him, they took him along as, just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A, a furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drowned? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. And he said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Well, I've often read this scripture in a way that felt like Jesus was kind of upset about being um, woken up. And he was a little frustrated with the disciples that they didn't handle it themselves. 
But that isn't what's here at all. I recently heard someone um, say that you can really tell someone's view of God by the tone of voice they use when they're quoting, when they're talking about these parts of scripture, when they're talking about Jesus and when he's rebuking people. Because Jesus is talking to their freak out. Don't you care if we drowned? They panicked. He said, why, in essence, he's saying, why did you doubt? Of course I'll be there. He's not saying, dude, why did you wake me up? Deal with it yourself. He's saying, why did you even doubt? Of course. God wants us to rely on him and ask for help. He knows that we can't, that we can't see the end from the beginning, but he can. And we can rely on him with full faith that he will calm the storm. The second question that we often ask is how can we rely on God when we are so completely overwhelmed? Sometimes it's so hard to even get a prayer out. In Matthew 14, to 36, we find another time that Jesus rescued the disciples. You see, Jesus had been, um, feed, he fed the 5,000, and then he sent the disciples on ahead because he needed time by himself. And there was a huge storm that night and what should have been a, a fairly short trip Hours into the night, the disciples were still rowing, just kind of on a treadmill of water. They just had not progressed as far as, as they should have. And Jesus comes walking on the water. Now, I can tell you that they freaked out. And sometimes when God shows up, it's scary. And our first thought is a little bit of a panic. But Jesus um, says, you know, don't be afraid. And Peter says, if that's you, have me come out to you on the water. I want to point out that when you feel like um, you should step out for Jesus and he calls you to something bold, it's really good to ask him to actually ask you first. Um, and so P Jesus called Peter out and Peter gets out of the boat and starts walking on the water. And then pretty soon the waves start coming and he lost his focus, started going down. And so many of you know from our story that on May 11th, my husband Wes had a major heart attack in the place that we're staying in Victorville, California. Boeing moved Wes down there for um, eight months and will be coming back permanently at the end of September. After calling 911 and working to keep Wes alive, the paramedics arrived and I had to get out of the way. And that's, you know, in that first wave, I was okay because I was just focused on the task at hand. But when I got up and tried to get out of the way, that's when the first wave hit. I, I saw them use the paddles on my husband. And when that didn't fix everything and they continued with CPR, I realized that my husband, Wes, might not make it. And that's when it really hit me. And I, I walked to the back of the house to kind of be out of their way. And the first time, the first thing I did was on my way, I texted my prayer partners. I have a group of four other women, and we talk almost daily on Marco Polo and text and pray over one another as we walk through life. And so the first thing I did was to text them and ask for prayer. And then the next thing I did was to call my kids for prayer. And Andrew turned out to be the lucky one who answered to a freaked out mom. But he handled it so well. And he, he said, I remember him saying, Mom, it's going to be okay. And um, within, and then he handled talking to his siblings. But within minutes, while they were still working on my husband, people all over the world were praying. My friends were praying. One of my friends posted on Pursuit Church Live's prayer wall. And my kids called their churches and their families' churches. And that included you. Thank you very much for praying for us. It made a huge difference. Um, once the prayer structures were in place and the first wave of emotion had dissipated a bit, I had to answer a lot of questions from the sheriff and the firefighters. And then we, they wheeled Wes out. They had a machine that continues to do CPR even as they're transporting him. And according to medical records, they even continued CPR in the ER. He almost didn't make it. And after they left, the firemen and the sheriff helped me put the living room back, which was so nice. 
Um, and then um, I had to drive myself to the hospital. And I, I saw the sheriff. He followed me for a while just to make sure I wasn't freaking out. But it was during that drive that the next wave hit. The picture of them wheeling Wes out, using a machine to keep him alive, rose up in my mind and I realized that I didn't know if my husband was dead or alive. How do you pray when you're so overwhelmed? Many of us have faced moments like, not exactly like that, but moments where we can see that life might be irrevocably changed, especially in the last year and a half. And sometimes, and I'm sorry, for some time, I have been using the prayer, the pause app, which Pastor Dwayne pointed out to us. And I haven't used it all the time, but I've used it enough from time to time to help focus my mind on God. And in that moment while I was driving, the prayer that you learn in the pause app came to my mind. Lord Jesus, I give everyone and everything to you. And as I was driving, I prayed that over and over until I had really been able to put my husband in God's lap. This breath prayer was what came to me while I was driving. And I laid Wes at God's feet. And God was my right hand. He held my right hand. He calmed me. He raised me above the waves again. One of my daughters called me while I was wandering around the parking lot trying to find my way into the hospital. I got to tell you that my whole my kids decided that that was the funny moment because the, the sheriff had told me, just go to the ER and when you pull up, you'll see you just park and you can go right in. Well, I went to the hospital and there's no ER sign on the whole, it's on a main thoroughfare and there's no ER sign. So I parked what seemed to be the most logical place and I'm walking around the hospital. And finally, I um, got off the phone with my daughter and called the hospital to say, where is your ER? Because I couldn't find it. And it turns out it's tucked around on the back side of the, of the hospital. So if you're from the area, you know where it is. For the rest of us, it's a mystery. So um, I finally found my way to the ER. And they were so kind to me. You see, COVID's changed how we do the ER. And I totally expected them to send me back to my car. Uh, but I needed to know if Wes was alive. And so I went up and I told the admitting nurse, I said, I, I'm here. They brought my husband in and I just need to know if he's alive. And instead of sending me back to my car, they actually took me back and put me in a hallway behind them um, with a chair so that I could wait in a place that was quiet and not have to be in the, um, out in the parking lot with all the family of those who are in the um, ER. And then they let me back to see Wes, and they had already prepped him for surgery. You see, his heart attack happened at roughly 8 p.m., and by midnight, he had four stents put in and was in ICU. Every time I started to sink that night, God showed up, just like Peter walking in the water, and all that I had to do was to cry out, and he lifted me. Maybe you feel like this in life. It's just gotten overwhelming. This might be a health situation, or it might be your finances, or your job, or relationship. Or it might just be the stress we all feel from coming through this difficult time of COVID. Focus your mind on Jesus. He will raise you above the wave. So here's the question. Where has God showed up for you lately? And then our last question is what happens when, Jesus, when God doesn't show up? You see, um, Jesus had some friends, Mary and Martha, and they had a brother named Lazarus. And Lazarus got sick, and they could tell he was dying, and they sent for Jesus. And scripture tells us that Jesus said, okay, and he didn't do anything about it. And, and his disciples were like, huh? And, and then when they started to go back a few days later, he said, he's already died. And the disciples were as puzzled as, as the rest of us. And so Martha and then Mary both met him as he came into town at several times and said, if you'd been here, he wouldn't have died. And I think sometimes we feel like if God had done his job, I wouldn't have had this hard time. But Jesus, when we look at the overarching thing, we see that Jesus was at, was at work in something different. He could have healed Lazarus, but he let Lazarus die. And Mary and Martha went through a very rough time. They called down the mourners from Jerusalem and Family and friends from Jerusalem had come down. So there was a lot of people there now. 
And when Jesus went to the tomb and raised Lazarus from the dead, the Bible indicates that that was when the people in Jerusalem decided to start plotting to kill him. In raising Lazarus from the dead, Jesus set up his own crucifixion so that he could provide abundant life to all of us. He had something much bigger in mind. To Mary and Martha, it felt like they let him down. He let him down. But in the broader picture, we see what God was really at. We see that Jesus didn't abandon them, that he was at work. Back to Wes's heart attack. So the surgery they did that night um, was cut short because Wes's kidneys started to fail. And so they got four stents on the left side of his heart, but there was still one left to be done on the right. And so the doctor told us that he'd do it uh, before when Wes was healed. And on July 8th, less than two months later, they went back in to do the fifth stent and found that a new artery on the left had become 99.5% blocked, like completely blocked. And this one was very near a main artery. So that means in less than two months, he developed a new blockage. And at the end, uh, and so he was really on the edge of another heart attack. If his kidneys hadn't failed in the first surgery, they, wouldn't have, they would have never found and fixed that sixth blockage. It was God's provision. What looked like a, a bad thing was a good thing. And today, I got to tell you, Wes is healthier than I am. We went for a hike last weekend. He's out working in 100 degree temps and plus every day. And we went for a hike last weekend and my heart rate went way up into aerobic zone. His was barely impacted. He's, he's in great shape and God has really healed him well. Um, and so, sorry, I'm looking for where I was. God wants us to rely on him. He's always at work. Even when you can't figure it out, when you feel abandoned, when it feels like things are going against you, that's when he's working deepest for your good. That's when you can trust that he will help you. Sometimes we sit on the edge of our seat so that when things are a little bit easy, we can trust in God. But when things are really hard, well, then we want to trust in God and our own worrying half the time. But God wants us to really rely on him. He isn't disappointed in us when we cry out for help. When it feels like we're losing, he holds us up with the right hand of righteousness. And when the waves of life are threatening to sink us, he becomes our strength. And even when it looks like he didn't show up and let us down, we find that he was working for our greater good. So here's your questions for reflection. Are you in a difficult place right now? What does that place feel like? Are you relying on God, or are you just using him as one of your resources? Have you ever felt like God let you down? What might you have been up, and what might God have been up to in the long run? If you've never really trusted God with everything, today's your day. If you'd like to trust him fully, I'd like to give you a moment to respond. You can post in the comments below, you can uh, messenger us and um, in that Facebook Messenger app or, for, or on um, the website. You can f even go on the website and fill out a connection card. For others of you, you realize that you've slipped into seeing God as one of your resources but haven't really relied on him fully, trusting that he will help you from his infinite resources. If this is you and you'd like to make that shift, I'd like to invite you to respond now as well. You can post in the comments, you can messenger on Facebook, you can go to the website and fill out the connection card. But I'd like to, you to actually reach out and let somebody know of the decision that you're making. And I'm gonna pray for you. And then we're gonna go into communion. Lord, I just pray for each one of us that you would help us trust in you. And Lord, for those who for today was the first time that they've truly decided that they're going to wholly trust in you, I want to invite you to join me in this prayer. Today, Lord Jesus, I put my hope and my trust in you. Thank you that you are reliable, that you will help me. 
Lord, I pray that you would open my heart to hear your voice and do what you say. I accept you as my God and my Savior. Amen. And so we are going to go into communion. And as you might know, or you might not, communion consists of bread and a cup. And the night before Jesus was arrested, he sat with the disciples and he said to them, this is the cup of the new covenant. Do this in remembrance of me. This is my body. Take and do this in remembrance of me. And so we do communion as remembrance of what Jesus did for us. And we learn a lot about the body and about our relationship with God through this symbol. The body, Jesus, as he walked through the cross, he was beaten, he was mocked, he, people were mean, and he, they were awful, and he was physically at the end of his rope. But he was still able to reach out in love. Remember how we talked today about God being, holding our right hand, and his, the source of his strength is his righteousness. Well, that's what we need, isn't it? We need that strength that Jesus showed on the way to the cross, to love other people even when we're in pain. And that's what this promises. So God, we give you this bread today, and we thank you for what you did. The Bible says that, the same, that when we accept you into our heart, that the same spirit that lived in you now lives in us. And you can teach us to love along the way, even when it's hard. And so we pray, Lord, that you would be our helper, that you would help us to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take the bread. And then there's a cup. As when Jesus died, the, um, the temple curtain that separated the Holy of Holies where God was and the rest of the place was torn in two from top to bottom. And it's because of this. Because Jesus died so that we could be in God's presence all the time. And that being in his presence wouldn't wipe us out because of our sins. Jesus' blood paid the price for our sins so that we could have a relationship with God. And so as we take the cup, it's in this you can know that when you call out, God will hear you. You don't have to work your way into his good graces. He's already listening. He's already there. And when you need help, the Holy Spirit is already there. He will give you the help you need. So God, we thank you for shedding, Jesus, we thank you for shedding your blood on the cross. And we thank you for covering us so that we can have the Holy Spirit living in us, so that we can be in God's presence and he can hear us. And when we cry for help, we know he's there and he's answering. God, I just pray that you'd help each one of us apply this to our lives on a real level. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go ahead and take the cup. Thank you for spending time today. As we close, I wanted to highlight another group that is coming up um, starting September 12th. On Sunday nights, the new houses will be leading How We Love. And I've been listening to this book on my morning walks, and this book is amazing. Whether you're single or married, if you want to get to the point of honest, real connection with, with a spouse today or in your future, this class is for you. We usually think this sort of book is for couples, but the new house has pointed out that this will be particularly helpful to young adults who aren't yet in a relationship because it helps you learn how to uh, um, create a good relationship. You can find more information and sign up for this and other classes at shorelinecc.com groups, or you can sign up in the church app. You click on, you open the church app, you click on groups, and then you scroll down to the bottom and click on small groups, and that'll give you the opportunity to see all the groups that are open. So as we close, let's do our benediction. 
Numbers 6, 24 to 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Now go and live for Jesus. Thank you.